She tears you down, darling. Says you're nothing at all. She tears you down, down, down. She tears you down, but I'll be through Hey, hi, I'm Phil. This is my brother Dan. We're Brooks Brothers, you're watching computer music. So we'll have a little look at the drums here. We've got three kick drums here. Well actually one of them's a hi-hat, so let's start with those. Just start with a very basic kick drum. Um, it's quite punchy, it's got the right it's got a bit of boom to it as well, but not, not too much. It's got the right kind of frequency that you're looking for from a main sort of from a main kick drum. So we've opened the just a simple waves frequency analyzer for to have a look at this kick drum. So you can see that this peak here is 110 hertz, which is around the kind of frequency range that you're looking for for a drum bass kick drum. Normally it's kind of between, 110. Yeah, between like 90, <coughs> 100 and 110. So we decided to use that and we just did a little bit of a low cut there. Um, just to take out any yeah sort of booming. But good to leave as much as you can in without without it sounding too muddy or rumbly. Yeah, and beware of some plugins that as soon as you open them up actually affect the low end spectrum already. Because if you've got a loud signal, then some some plugins can react in different ways. So just just listen quite carefully and see if it's changing the sound too much. We've added another kick drum. Just because we felt that that kick drum on its own, no matter how much we boosted it, just lacked a little bit of uh, kind of warmth or uh, a bit of deepness, really, just and a, a bit, bit of, of dirt in a way, a little bit of dirt. So we added a kind of raw kick drum, like a processed funk brain kick drum. Adds a bit of character. Yeah, as Phil says, just adds a bit of character and makes it sound a little bit stronger. Um, so on that kick drum, we've just compressed it slightly. Um, with a pretty sharp attack, just of 0.19 milliseconds, which means that after that point, 0.19 milliseconds after the kick drum comes in, it, the signal's being compressed so that it sounds snappier. It's got a quick attack, so it's, it sounds slightly snappier. And we've got a little bit of a boost there at 130, which would have been, which would have been a nice little resonant peak in the kick drum, which we can bring out using this Waves EQ. And then what we've added is a hi-hat as well. So normally with low end, to get really good low end it's important to focus on top end as well. So um, when you're doing stuff like kick drums it's normally a good idea to layer them with higher sounds. Um, just so you can control that top end element of the kick drum a lot easier. Generally we wouldn't use like a kick hat, a, a kick hat, a kick with a hi-hat in it. Well, no. Or if we did take the roll the top end off and use like two split, but this so is you can just control. A hat. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that's what I mean. But yeah. you wouldn't take. We wouldn't use a kick with a hi hat in it. No, yeah. We use a it, kick yeah. and a hi hat, a standalone kick, and then layer an extra hi hat, so you have that control. With a lot, with a lot of breaks, like it's hard to kind of. They have hi hats or cymbals over. The kick already, so I mean you can't really. There's not much you can really do. You just have to kind of roll with the break and just use it. You don't want to really interrupt the flow of it by kind of separating it about too much. So that's the kick. That's those three kick drums all together. And then it sounds nice and weighty. So we're happy with those. It's basically two kick drums in our hi hat. The snare drums. This is a more attacky snare, sort of in the high frequency range. No 200 hertz or any lower end, just a tight, high, snappy snare. And then any low end, we've been careful to EQ out or EQ out to the extent where it's not clashing in any way with, with the lower snare that we're going to add on, mm. basically. And yeah, I guess the important thing here is just to find a nice snappy snare. For that, just to, just for that, for that, um, to help the snare cut through the mix, nice and clean, as little resonance as possible. So we've layered it with a processed snare. This is the snare that we've processed, it's like, it's like a drum machine, a drum machine. Done some enveloping, just to try and get a nice uh, 
kind of electronic sound that we can layer with other more funky breaky snares and sort of create a, a total snare sound. It's always a mixture between like a, a drum machine snare for the weight and the presence and punch and then like a funk, a more funky break kind of snare to add the character. Yeah, so that, that snare would, would be supplying us with the low end that we need to kind of to make the tune. That's the weight that you hear in the club and then the other one on top will just provide... Help it cut through the mix and provide a sort of uh, snappier element to the snare. Um, so those two snares together sound like this. Sorry, they don't, they sound like this. <laughs> so you can hear it's got that lower, sort of, lower frequency range there. And it's got the higher frequency range as well. That's so, actually, yeah. Yeah. That should actually be it. So then we added a sort of white noisy kind of action snare, which um, I think... Just the tail of it really, not really I much transient. If you look it. at the audio shape, we've, um, we've actually done a little fade in at the start, just so, it, um, just so the start doesn't really clash with, um, with the attacks of the other snares. So um, that's going to sound like this. So you're just really getting the tail from the action snare, just providing a nice kind of reverb. You want to make sure with every snare that you layer to make sure that the transients work, tweak the transients so they work perfectly with each other, so it's not too smacky or not too, not, not too harsh basically. By transients he means the start of the hit, so it's like when the stick hits the drum, that's the, that's the transient sound, it's the first sound you hear. So. When you're layering up snares, obviously you're layering up a lot of transients on top of each other and you want to be careful which transients you're actually using as opposed to which ones you don't want, which, the ones you want. which snares you're using for that purpose and which snares you're using for the more, yeah. for the more um, longer snare sounds. I know that when, tail. when we started out making beats we used to just layer like ten snares on top of each other and not touch the transients, just trying to get a really fat sound but we realised that less is more. Um, the more you take away and the more you leave like one transient sounding snappy and one like more kind of just fading in or whatever, the easier it is to get a good clean fat snare sound. Having done the snares and the kicks, now we've got now we're gonna have a listen to how they sound together. <coughs> so got a nice full sound there we're covering the top hand in the kick drum and the snare drum, in the bottom end of the kick drum and the bottom end of the snare drum. Okay. All the bass is covered. Got all the bass is covered, so... We wouldn't normally necessarily work in this order, but we might start with a break. Sometimes we might start with kicks and snares and then add the breaks later on. Sometimes, most of the time really, we, we start with a break and then start layering it out with individual hits. Either way, it's always a mixture of breaks and hits. Like, we don't... I don't think we've ever release the track where it's just single hits or just... No, no. Hmm. We always use breaks because breaks is what... But just you get that yeah, jungle drum, drum and bass feel. You, you, can't you don't want your drums to sound yeah. really hitsy and not be able to hear that live that live feel in the background so we... Yeah, it's virtually impossible to recreate like the, the kind of ambience you get from a break with single hits. Or yeah, so we generally <coughs> try very hard to keep the breaks as a prominent element of the drum mix. So we'll have a little look now at some of the techniques we've used to get a bit of roll into the beat. So we've added a couple of little high end bits and hi hats, reversed hi hats. So this is like three parts together which kind of just represents us adding different like um, individual hi-hats and different elements to create a sort of backing roll, high top end roll that you, we can put behind that skeleton and it will have, help it give a bit of stereo in the top end and also give a bit of movement. It's just made up of like reversed hits and um, normal hi-hats of course and 
Uh, this one I think is just the hits from a break called by with like a fast attack and quite a heavy compre uh, on on a, on quite quite a heavy compression ratio. Sorry. So this is the kick drum layered with the snare drum and our top end hi hat stuff all together. So you can hear the. Uh, the hi hats there giving it a nice little movement, the way they're enveloped and stuff. So, this is the beat we've got so far with the elements we've added. Still sounds quite drum machine y, even though we added those hi hats from the break. So, I mean, I don't know, some artists might roll with that break, roll with that beat how it is, but we're quite keen on the live sound of drum breaks, so what we've done is uh, made a little um, sort of combination break here out of three different breaks. I mean these were three breaks that were on the track that we just bounced down as as one after they were all processed properly and properly contained. Yeah, so this is effectively three different breaks that we had to bounce because we were running out of CPU. So if we mix that with the rest of it, then that is actually the full beat. So you can hear those breaks really add to the roll and give it a live sound, which is very hard to achieve without actually using original breaks. So yeah, that's pretty much it. That's, that's our beat. And um, once we've done the beat, we feel like we're ready to move on to the other elements of the tune. Here is like the main vocal, which is kind of the starting point of the track. Um, the track is kind of just built around this hook. So it's quite an old vocal, it was quite hard to... It was quite hard to get sounding good, but I think it came out alright. It came um, out well, there was a lot of rhythmic things that we had to do. Yeah, we? Changing yeah. around rhythms and stuff. It was quite It was quite hard to fit it in 174 or drum yeah. play speed, which is what we write at. Here. This here is like a, it's basically a copy of the vocal, but it's a fifth of the vocal. So it's just when the two play together, it just gives quite a quite a weird harmonic effect. But it's kind of I think people used to use that a lot in old school jungle, and like hardcore and stuff. So it kind of adds to the old school vibe and the old school flavour of the tune. Basically, what we did was just took the vocal and using a program called Melodyne which is a great program to edit vocals with. We pitched, like Phil said, we pitched the, the vocal up five, um, sorry, up sem seven semitones, which is a fifth, and just straight laid it on top of the original, and then did a little um, volume, a uh, bit of volume automation on the pitched up version. So what we got was that so fading okay. effect. Yeah. So if we listen to that pitched up version of the vocal, Listen to it by itself. Um, so this is up seven semi times from the original. Then with the original. This gives a weird kind of unearthly kind of effect, which sounds kind of nice. And I think what we did as well, which I'd forgotten to mention, was when we did this looped um, but I pick you up bit of the vocal, we added a chorus to give it a kind of that's what gives it a kind of weird sort of 80s -y, crazy sound. The frequencies are kind of all phasing in and out of each other. Yeah. But it kind of adds to the energy in a weird way, we thought. So. A kind of disco -y kind of effect. So, in this context, well, in the context of tracks, it sounds like. Coming out now. When we find a, a good vocal, we. Um, Obviously try and find as many good bits from it as possible, chop out as many nice bits as possible. Um, so like, this is another little... That wasn't meant to happen, a little clip. Um, so yeah, just trying to find as many usable bit, as many usable bits from a vocal as possible. So actually, that this yeah, Phil did the vocals for this track, so he would have sourced these different parts of the vocal um, for us to use, and then we just try them in different parts of the track and see which which 
part, bits of vocals yeah. suit which parts yeah. of the track best. And then. Um, because the so in context, it's just like so when the original it. when the original vocal takes a play, we've got this coming around just to just to keep provide a bit of interest basically when the vocal, when the main vocal loop is running over the track. So we um, did a bit of automation as well on the delay. Um, we kind of automated the feedback on a delay alongside some automation on a filter. Um, to get this effect. And I think there's a bit of a phaser or something on there as well, but that kind of uh, lets that vocal section fade out but continue on through the loop and it kind of helps to keep the energy going yeah. and, and makes it so it's not kind of things are statically coming in and out. They've got nice delays and little bits of intricacy that carries on in it. Exactly, yeah. just again to uh, provide a bit of interest. The thing was, with the main vocal loop, um, the nicest bit that I could find, well, in my opinion, was obviously this main loop, and it didn't fit the full eight bars. So, with this, with the down, I just repeated it three times, just, so, just to elongate the loop, so I didn't have to use any other sections that weren't quite is harmonically or rhythmically nice. I think the, the repetition of the down that, that Phil implemented is what gives it that kind of um, fill, fills the gap and gives it that that kind of dancey flavour that it wouldn't have had originally. Yeah, yeah. And then Dan took the the pick you up at the end and, and looped it, which looped it for the second section, which gives it a really nice energy. Yeah, and then I added a chorus, like I said, and. Um, did, we did the um, pitching up seven to add on top of that for a bit more effect, but I think also we um, we processed the original vocal quite heavily, um, didn't we? We just a lot of the time we put vocals in melodyne and fiddle around a little bit with the with the, with the pitch uh, of each note, yeah. just to try and make it fit better with the tune. And also, it's good for when you've got like a, a dodgy sample if you take something and just with it through Melodyne, you can end up with something that just sounds completely different but still sounds wicked. Like you would detune a saw wave or something, we detune the vocal slightly um, on this tune. So we uh, we basically bounced the version and pitched it up a couple of cents and just laid it on top. Um, and then we just added a little bit of reverb. So then our idea was to kind of add a piano, um, a piano chord sequence pattern, whatever you want to call it, on top of um, what we'd done. So we wrote a kind of old school kind of nineties piano piano sequence. Yeah, just to kind of complement that old school flavour that was already kind of cooking up. Yeah, we kind of heard something slightly kind of old school y in there. <laughs> yeah. And we thought <laughs> might as well try and elaborate on that. So we wrote a little piano chord sequence which sounds like this. She It's a little bit crackly because the tune's the struggling CPU a little bit. The CPU is just over so What we wanted to do was try and get kind of a 90s, quite a budget sound, so it sounds a little bit naff, but it works in the mix quite well. Um, and that was a really hard that's, part, actually. And so that's like immediately a basis, your basis for, for the whole tune, really. So like the vocal and the chord sequence together. And We've got this Roland thing, which can. This is the, the piano part out of the Roland. So that actually sounds better and warmer and sonically nicer than the piano sound we've got in the tune, but. Um, would never work in the mix. Basically, it just it, it just shapes it. Overpowers it. It, it, it just doesn't it? sit in the mix. So it took us ages, didn't it, to find yeah. find the right piano sound. We went through loads of different techniques trying to trying to nail this sound, and um, eventually, I think we just found uh, a sample of like an old sort of nineties piano sound. 
just a one note sample, we just stretched it across the keyboard and it, it actually had a much better sound than... Yeah, when he says stretch it across the keyboard he means taking it into like a, a multi-sampler, in our case it would be Halion um, and just stretching it so it's just running across the keyboard so you've got a sample and now you can just play it up and down up and down the scale like you could a normal instrument which a lot of the time it can sound terrible because you're stretching it, you're pitching it up and down um, so you don't want to stray too far from the original pitch but it can work really well in some instances so it kind of gave it a little bit of a crappy sound that, that actually worked it's really well for the quite purpose. endearing sound as well it's quite yeah it's quite a mid rangey sort of raw piano sound, not much warmth or anything, but when you mix it, it does sound, it does sound quite good, I think. Once it kind of gets going, we layered it with some other sounds, some more phasier piano sounds, just to fill up the mix. Uh, it kind of made it sound... What we generally tend to go for is loads of sounds layered together to the point where you can't actually sort of define the point where one sound ends and another one starts, so it kind of forms an entire wall of sound uh, feeling, so you can't really uh, separate the sounds in your head. That's kind of what we tried to tried to go yeah. for, basically, it's, which is why we kind of added phasier pianos in this element. This is to go with the looping, but I pick you up section of the vocal. It sounds a bit kind of black adder on its own, but it definitely works within the context of of the mix. A bit medieval, yeah. So, when the tune drops, the piano sound like this. When the next section comes in, they sound like this. So the rhythm's different as well to to accompany what, what else is going on in the tune at that point better rhythmically and sonically it's slightly more layered and a little bit phasier with kind of rogue frequencies that you can't really tell what they're doing but when you add them to the mix they sound really cool. We were telling you earlier that we used a kind of a bit naff sounding 90s rave piano sound and spread it across the keyboard. This is how it sounds just on its own. So it does sound pretty, pretty crappy, but um, with the other piano sounds, it adds a nice sort of uh, mid-rangey attack to it, yeah. which we felt helps mix the sound and it just fills it's, the gap. It's not uneven in terms of its frequency spectrum, yeah. so it fit in the mix quite nicely. Now that we've got the skeletal elements of the track down, this is when we like to start having fun with samples um, and synths and um, trying to fill it out in as best we can, really and try and create that kind of wall of sound. Little guitar, kind of wah. Little. With a little volume envelope as well, as you can just see, so it's just fading in getting bit by bit yeah. towards the end of the 16 bar section. Oh yeah, that's it's worth saying as well. It's, it, it doubles in speed towards the end of it, if you solo it oh, again. Yeah. Solo it again. Yeah. So that's like just when the, um, with the end with the pick you up, it kind of works in tandem to give a real energy. Yeah, so leading up to the end of the loop, which leads to a good tip, which is when you're doing build ups and stuff, and you've got samples running in in, in loop, it's good to maybe double the speed that they're running at. Yeah, just, just make them faster, just increase, just increase the, energy the energy towards the end of your loop. So this, um, is, this is a pad that Phil sampled off a uh, an old soul an old CD. crooners. Record, shall we say? Um, can't give away the sample source for legal reasons, um, but it works pretty nicely and just adds a bit of a minor feel to the loop. More just random samples, just to provide character, different harm harmonics. Um. So what we would have done is found these samples with using a sampler, so what we're doing is pitching a sample up and down until we find the right pitch that it works with the track and then um, once we find the right pitch we'll look for the best place to put it in the loop and Normally then, bounce it into audio, or yeah. unless we're already doing it in audio but a lot of the time we'll take like a bunch of samples and then put them into Halion all at one time and then so for instance 
Shall I get a MIDI track up and show? Um, well, we'll do we'll deal with that in a sec. Yeah, I mean, just basically import like say ten samples into Halion. So you've got your ten or samples or whatever in. sampler you use. Yeah, or whatever. And so you're just playing, and at the same time you've got your finger ho ho like hovered over the the semitone button, so you can just pitch them around and just find the right pitch and see what works nicely and what. So we might what load in work. fifty samples or however many we can fit, and just play them all like that and just see if we come across any that work with the tune and then um, yeah we'll just hover around the pitch as well and just see if we can pitch it around and make it sound better like Phil said um, but we do prefer to bounce stuff into audio because audio has really good envelope controls in mm. Cubase and we like to do a lot of automation and it's uh, easier to have complete control over everything once it's bounced into audio for example say this sound here it's just like a, a little sort of string sample with a, don't know, some other stuff in there. Um, so what we've done is loop that every four bars, but every other one has a little um, volume fade in. Um, that must be for a, for a good enough reason. I can't remember why, but it must mix with the other elements yeah. that little bit better with that little fade in, or provide just that little bit of variety, which. Um, can make all the difference, just so stuff's not just going round and round. Yeah, it is going round and round, but slightly different. Each With different time. changes over time, just keep it interesting. Another reason we like do little fade-ins on samples is sometimes it's really hard to get rid of a crackle on the end of the beginning of a sample. So just using that little fade-in on the envelope and um, audio just immediately gets rid of it. I remember for years trying to get rid of crackles and having no luck, and it's just something is. Simple as that. So there's four different, uh, like, it's groups of oscillators in Albina. So it's we've used three of them here. One's got a rich saw and a sawtooth wave, one's got a spectral wave and a sawtooth wave, and the other's got an organ wave as as the main thing. So the organ helps to kind of um, give it that really flat, pure tone sound that it has. Um, and yeah, I just we just fiddle around with stuff basically until we get it sounding fat, add a bit of white noise and make sure all the cut-offs are like in the right positions and... Um, <laughs> a lot of trial and error. So you can see that this one note has quite a rich sort of distorted harmonics in there and stuff. So what we did was use that as the kind of main. We used the sidechain version of that as the main, um, the main kind of backing for our for our for our piano chords. <laughs> Sounds a little bit weird. But, um, <laughs> it works. In this track, it's quite heavy side chaining to the snare. It's actually quite heavy, quite heavy kind of housey effect. Yeah, we normally work from presets and then tweak them, unless we're using quite a simple synth like Massive, where we can just make bass sounds quite easily. Mm. Um, FM8 or something which is quite a deep kind of form of synthesis we we kind of generally tend to start with presets and then do our own thing and we kind of tweak know, into our taste know and which way it's going to work in, in our tracks yeah so we're going to go through the bass line and how it was done um, in this case we've just loaded up two instances of massive soft synth by native instruments which is a pretty good synth for making your own sounds and uh, it's very easy to use. Um, very easy to highly use. Highly recommended for kind of beginners of getting into synthesis and stuff. So we uh, we just wanted the bass line to be functional. We wanted it to have a good low end, um, and we just followed the pattern that the chords were doing basically. Um, so we layered two massives up on top of each other. This is the first instance of massive layered with a higher kind of saw wave sound that has a bit of modulation on it which you'll hear when it comes in. So that's the sub. 
which has a bit vela father volume, and that's the higher um, saw or square wave, mixed between a saw and a square wave sound. And then there's um, the rest of the bass line, following the chord sequence, following the original piano that we took you through. So that's pretty much what we call just a functional bass line. It's got a solid low end and uh, it doesn't draw too much attention to itself, just fills out that low frequency spectrum that we're looking to fill. And then we layered it with a more harmonic driven mid-range uh, bass sound. So this will be, still hear that other sound on top of it because that's a sample in audio, but oh, it's been bounced anyway. So this was just a saw two wave going through a low pass filter with an LFO and it's very basic sound. Um, which is generally the best way to go with bass, I mean, apart from the modulation aspects, the, the actual waves that you use should be pretty, pretty basic. I mean, there's no point uh, going in too deep because there's not actually that much difference between them anyway. And you're not going to hear, really hear it beneath everything either. I mean, the sounds may not sound amazing by themselves, but within the context of the tune, they, you know, they work perfectly. So we'll do some pretty careful EQing as well, like as you can see there's uh, this is the second mid-range sound, we've got a chain of eight plugins we've got a pretty random chain there, uh, it's probably technically completely um, wrong but it was doing what we wanted it to and each it's basically resonant uh, based, resonant peak EQing so we'll be taking out subtractive, sub yeah, okay. subtracting sort of um, resonant peaks, which might be um, make causing strange harmonics in the bass. So like looking for stuff. So we'll scroll across like the bass and um, look, look finding the resonant, the nasty resonant bits, and just taking them down. Say there was some might work there. and some might not. So the ones that don't work, you'll be using subtractive EQing, and the ones that do work. You'd be using additive EQ to bring them out because just, those are yeah. the flavours that you'll want to focus on. So by taking a really, really uh, narrow cue and just skirting along the frequency band, just looking for horrible resonant sounds. And then or nice them. resonant sounds. But you've got to be careful not to take too much out. Sometimes you can just get a bit over surgical and make sounds too clean. Yeah, the good thing about this kind of EQ is that you can isolate which parts of the frequency spectrum are making a sound sound like it does. Each bass sound will be made out up out of loads of these kind of peaks within itself and um, these are the ones that we're looking to control in order to get the bass sounding how we want it to. Mm. So what we've done is we've done a chain of well that one, that's a pretty hefty sort of um, bandy uh, kind of EQ setting got lots of <laughs> crazy EQ settings here but we're just trying to bring out this is the BBE Sonic Maximizer which takes brings up some top end as well so we're just kind of messing around with the sound until what we've got is a very resonant harmonic -y sound that when layered on top of the sub bass gives a very full effect in the mix so this is the bass line with the both bass sounds that we've showed you. What we're going to do now is mute the second one that we showed you and you can see how much life that actually adds to the sub. So that's that's just the sub on its own and it just sounds a little bit um, a little bit flaky there. I'm not too keen on tunes that just have sub as bass, I like a little bit more and so does Phil so we always try and spend time getting that um, that low mid warmth. So this is what this second massive part does. It just provides the time really because with the sub bass uh, you get the weight but sometimes you lose the note and by providing that extra layer on top you can really hear the note coming through, the harmonic coming through rather than just kind of the weight. So that's pretty much uh, the bass although just incidentally we do use filtered versions of the bass in breakdowns as well to kind of add a low warmth to the breakdowns so this is this part would have would have stemmed from one of the massive parts um, 
to the random atmospheric sound. And that would be layered underneath the chords and pad sounds being filtered in around and around the breakdown area. Yeah. Just to provide the kind of low warmth but not enough to remove impact from the sub when it actually when it drops. I mean the reason why it looks like that as well is um because sometimes what you find with these old waves EQs is that they don't actually remove the frequencies that they're saying that they're removing. So you need to load them up again and do the, the same curve again just to double, double, yeah. wh double whammy kind of effect to make sure it gets rid of those frequencies. It's crazy. You can have a waves EQ taking out, say, like 150 and then put another one on. Take out the same amount, you can hear it taking out more than when you just have one on. So it's it shouldn't really work like that, but it just does. So most would say it's a pretty good reason not to use these EQs, <laughs> but they, these are actually really good EQs in general, and um, they, they don't take up too much CPU. Yeah, exactly. Your don't break your CPU at all. And um, actually applied a little bit of chorus to that mid-range sound as well, which is for most people a no-no because it's bringing in a stereo effect. This OTM plugin, you can basically monoize certain parts of the frequency spectrum with using this plugin. So we've got it at a setting of 256, which means that underneath that frequency, everything will be in mono, according to the width that we've applied here. So if we turn that to stereo, that would mean that everything underneath 256 would be stereo. What we've done is made sure that there's a little bit of stereo up hit up in the higher frequency spectrum, but down where we need everything to be mono and straight, everything's in mono, and so it's all cool. We've just done a pretty DJ-friendly intro. Um, 32 bars, which is just kind of standard in our tunes to have kind of, well, I mean, it's 32 bars of drum intro and then breakdown for 16 bars and then drop. Actually, the breakdown's for oh, 32, 32 bars. 32 bars and then drop. Yes. What we've done is just, uh, we wrote the main part of the drop first and then we were thinking what can we do for intro so we took some of the samples that we'd implemented into the main part of the drop and tried them just with drums at the beginning of the tune and then we just switched around the rhythms and tried to get a little 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 groove going that is quite easy to mix and doesn't sound, yeah. doesn't sound messy with other tunes and doesn't have too many elements because obviously we're making music for clubs which is going to be mixed with other music so I mean, don't, we don't want to litter yeah. it too much with, with sounds. We tend to do that quite a lot because we normally start a tune from the drop from like the, the kind of groove and then so we'll take sounds that we're using and implement them in different ways in the intro just for like a bit of variation but so, this, so, this, so it's easier to tie together. So these are the sounds that we've used for the intro which is the pad we showed you earlier only we've, um, we've looped it on a more regular basis. Every bar, it, it comes in again. With the guitar fading in to kind of colour the mix increasingly more and more. So a couple of little bits of vocal just to help it progress a little bit. Some high FM8 pad sound kind of messing around, providing textures. Then we did the breakdown, which took us quite a long time to get right, because it involved a lot of automation between different parts, which are all here. It's these parts here, and that's, that's pretty much it, that, um, making up the breakdown. <laughs> So what it is, is it's um, pretty much loads of different soft synths combined together and filtered um, so that they're kind of getting brighter and brighter across this 8 bars or 16 bars. I think we used a lot of FM8 for this and um, just a lot of filters and, tr and as you can see a lot of automation. So these will be filtering in these everything here will be kind the, um, of together. These will be the breakdown parts. So each one you can see has uh, different filters on it. I mean, different automation settings. And uh, what you want to do is just um, try and get them all so they complement each other. So that as one's going down, the other's going up, and all sorts of different patterns that you can 
like implement to make it sound cool. This is just an example of one of the parts of the breakdown. A bit of distortion and resonant filter, very high resonance setting. So that's pretty much it. You know, once we nailed the breakdown, we just we showed you how we did the drop. We just whacked it before the drop. What what we wanted to do was just to um, make it so that we had different sections that weren't using the vocal. So we we created a couple of sections which um, don't feature the vocal. You can't keep the vocal running the whole way through because it just gets boring and, and loopy. So we had to find other samples and other nice kind of melodies to complement the piano chords and the bass. So um, we added a like a guitar loop. Yeah. So this would be the guitar loop coming in now. This kind of strummy guitar loop that has a kind of more sort of melancholic feel to, to the loop. So it's kind of changing the vibe slightly as well. Which we like to try and do in our tunes is try and like bring in as many different vibes as possible within kind of one tune. Then we yeah, interesting. had little things coming in and out like this string here. All those little parts kind of help us to create different sections from where from which point we can go back and um, just structure it all up so that yeah. it, it rolls nicely for, for for people on the dance floor and for, for the listener. The more sections and different sounds and samples you have, the easier you'll find it to finish your tracks. You'll have different things to switch between, so it's not always constantly on one, looping just on one. Yeah, thing. what we try and do when we make a tune is, we actually take it in, into... Uh, we work on just like loads of sounds um, we work individually, on and then we bring those sounds together, find the best sounds, and that's a really good way of finishing the track. So we work on separate setups, and um, we come, come up with different ideas, and then yeah. bring them all back together. So like when Danny can... Bird came over to do um, Gold Rush, we had three different computers, we were all working on sounds at the same time, and it was a really good way of, of working and getting things done, and we all came together at the end. We got like a basic loop to work over, like a basic key, and then we all came up with different sounds, ideas, and once we pulled those sounds and ideas together, the whole thing came together really a lot easier than it would have done Yeah. if we were just working on one. I mean, computer. I think the key is we always start with the main sort of idea and the groove and then we try and work different sections out of that. So we always look at it as a progressive thing, like, yeah, we've got that main idea now. We need to firstly fill out that main idea so that sounds really good, but also be able to progress from that and go into other sections. So we prioritise trying to get um, different sections of our music that we can bring back and structure in the best way we see that, that we can it, like, envisage it. So with mix downs, we basically want to just play the track and listen as carefully as possible <laughs> to uh, try and get the parts to fit together as best as best we can. So one thing we like to do is open the mixer up and create an extra. Sort of graphic interface on top of the mixer that we can reference to, so that, that way we can see where each sound is peaking, and we can try and make things, for example, the kick and the snare, as level as possible. Mm. And um, we can just scroll through and see if anything's particularly loud sticking out. So these are loud, but those are the side chain signals, so those are okay. Um, so generally we try and get the kind of wall of, sa wall of sound effect where with a lot of EQing we mix all the pad sounds and um, all the musical elements together quite carefully and generally try and separate them in terms of frequency from the vocal to, as far as possible. And we went through the whole frequency spectrum thing for the drums as well. Um, if you get that right and you get the bass right and um, that's half the battle, battle one I that's guess. That's half if, the battle one, yeah. If you get that stuff right. 
Just very care careful attention to detail in terms of levels. Obviously, as you're making the track, it's not something you know we do all right at the end, right at the last minute. It's something we're conscious of the whole way through the process. So I think it's something you have to have in the back of your mind the whole time. Even when we start writing a track, we're thinking, what key is that track in? Is that, how's that going to work if the bass is in, in C? It's just something you always have to think of when you're approaching making drum and bass. Not that you should let it drive what you do. I mean, the key thing is obviously to come up with ideas that you think are good, but sometimes stuff's just not going to work if it doesn't, if the elements don't go together in terms of if you've got two major elements of the tune and they're, they're taking up the same frequency band or range of frequencies, then you're not going to be able to put them on top of each other. So it's quite important to think in terms of where are you looking to put the element that you're working on. And um, yeah. I think that's pretty much the most important thing about writing drum mm. bass and EQing it so that it fits with the sound that it has to go with at that point. So a lot of the times you're going to have to duplicate certain tracks and have different EQ settings on the same sound for different parts of the tune so that that sound will work with other sounds better. Also I mean, like in an intro if you've got a sample with a bit of low end that's not going to work over the drop and the bass is running underneath it, you can put that on a different track so you can hear a bit of those low frequencies in the intro which sound nice but obviously you don't want it muddying up your bass on the drop so that's another instance where we'll create a different, a different track. And then there's another the instance sound. where you copy your drums to the intro and they just don't sound right, they sound a bit too loud or too hitsy. So you've got to duplicate the tracks and turn them, turn them down and stuff, or just turn the gains down on that on the track. So there, you've got to be conscious of it the whole time, you know, and um, just keep your mind focused on once on getting the idea, but also getting the idea mixed downable, so that everything can fit together. So we've pretty much taken you through um, all the techniques <coughs> processes that we use to make our tunes. Um, Giving away all our magic secrets <laughs> for you lucky people at home. So yeah, get producing. <laughs> send us your tunes. <laughs> yeah, send us all your tunes. <laughs>